going on, everyone? I am Mark. You're watching Trading with a Dummy, the place where you get entertained and educated. And of course, you come here for the interviews as well. Today, I'm doing something a little bit different. As usual, you guys know I sit down and I talk to people who are in the financial literacy sector. But today, I'm going to talk with someone a little bit different. He is an entrepreneur. I saw one of his YouTube videos, I would say probably about a year, year and a half ago on YouTube. And he intrigued me because he had the name Mr. Monetize Everything. And I think it would be a perfect opportunity to bring him on, especially since I go from group to group to group when it comes to trading groups and I review them as well as courses. And I want to talk to the guy who literally makes a living off of monetizing everything. And I want to get his input and his thoughts on the whole process. But most importantly, I want you guys to hear his story. So ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause for George Pitts. What's going on, man? How you doing? Hey, man. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on, man. Let me go put this on two screens right there real quick. Actually, I like this one a lot better. Um, so first of all, uh, I saw you on YouTube. I enjoyed your story, and I wanted people to hear your story, how you end up getting into this business, specifically monetizing everything, because that's what you do, correct? correct. You have, um, you, you're basically a business strategist. That's what you consider yourself, Correct. Yes. So please tell me a little bit about your story and let me make sure I throw your banner up here as well so people can text you and get informed on what you do. But shoot, tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, man. So, uh, you know, uh, serial entrepreneur, uh, business coach and strategist. Um, I work mostly with coaches and content creators, teaching them how to turn um, their knowledge into profits with digital products. Um, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, people have come to me, um, you know, to teach them how to take what they know and turn that into digital courses. And then I've shown them how to break that down and just build their own economy financially. Um, because, you know, like I said, the foundation of my business is financial literacy. Um, that's kind of the foundation of how I started, but also just showing people how to take what they get and continue to build other streams of income. So they're not one of these people that just do one thing, they make a lot of money, they buy a lot of nice stuff. And then whenever that fizzles out or something goes wrong, or maybe just the sales die, they don't have anything else to fall back on. Uh, that's something that happened to me and kind of like the backstory of how I got started. And that's kind of what I hope people do. Yeah. So let's talk about your story. So uh, first of all, I want to know about your background a little bit, right? So where are you initially from? I'm from Oklahoma. Uh, so I, I, I was born and raised uh, here in Oklahoma. Uh, been here pretty much my whole life and, uh, you know, just uh, grew up, uh, you know, single mother, was raised by my grandmother, um, you know, me and my my sister. But, uh, yeah, just born and raised here in Oklahoma, man, country boy, um, you know, graduated high school, went to college for a couple years, went out and got a job and just kind of got my way through corporate and really just trying to build a, you know, a good, solid middle class living and you know how things happen, man, you know, you start to get pushed into your purpose. And, uh, you know, I started getting into entrepreneurship and I, I really got into it at an early age, but it really bit me really good um, whenever I became an adult. So before we get into your entire story about how you end up um, getting to where you are, what you said you went to college, right? Mm -hmm. What'd you go for? What degree did you pursue? So the degree I pursued, uh, ironically, was business administration. And one of the things about that degree is I learned nothing about business in general. I learned how to manage a business, but I didn't know what an LLC was. I didn't know what S-Corps were. I thought every business was an INC, you know, or, or an in, I, I said an incorporation, but that means corporation. Um, and so I didn't really learn much about it, but that's what my major was because I wanted to do business. Um, and that was really teaching you more how to manage someone else's business. Got you. So you went to school to basically learn about debt, getting yourself in debt, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, did you end up? It uh, yeah. I mean, did you end up um, getting scholarships at all or was it pretty much student loans and stuff like that? Student loans, you know, um, I, I had a couple offers to go play football at a couple schools and, you know, I, I didn't follow through with it. I ended up tearing my meniscus and then I just kind of fizzled out from sports altogether. Uh, so it was mostly, you know, Pell Grant. And then, of course, they enticed you to take Stafford and mm -hmm. the other loans, whatever they were, and just accumulated a lot of debt, man, which was just crazy. So, yeah, I learned how to get into debt. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's unfortunate. I mean, it's kind of like a I wouldn't call it a scam because obviously, you, you know, it's a well-respected um, thing to have, right? A degree and stuff. 
Right. But I'm, I'm sure you're probably right the same age like I am. You know, back in the day, just getting associates was a was a huge deal. Right. Um, but still, like looking at it now compared to back then, you see back then, you know, our, the American dream for us, I'm sure, was, you know, graduate high school, get a degree, get a nine to five, buy a house, have a car to have a family and then you're good to go. Right. Right. That was kind of like the American dream. Now, you said you played football, right? So when you were going through like high school and growing up and stuff with you and your sister, you said you were raised by your grandma, basically, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, was it pretty tough? Were you guys uh, middle class or, or were you on, on the low end? Spectrum? Low end. You know, we, we, we lived off my grandmother's, uh, you know, widow pension. Um, so my grandfather had passed away when I was um, about 10 years old. And, um, you know, so she got what they called a widow pension. Um, you know, and so that's pretty much what we lived off of. Um, it wasn't very much. I think it was about $900 a month. Um, and so, you know, she held that down and, um, you know, some different things. I mean, we were on food stamps and, and, and different things, just like anyone else. I mean, we didn't, you know, obviously we didn't miss a meal, but, you know, we weren't like dirt poor or nothing like that, but we weren't, I wouldn't consider us middle class or upper middle class. We we're pretty much the lowest of the lowest middle class you could get, if that makes sense. So did you focus on playing football more than anything at the beginning or was that like your goal to make it into the NFL? Not really. You know, I'd be alive. I said it did. It was just kind of the thing to do. You know, my cousins played, uh, you know, people that, you know, I ran with friends and stuff like that played. So it was just more of an influential thing. And I enjoyed it, uh, but it wasn't something that was like my long term goal, if that makes sense. It was just really like an extracurricular activity to do. Because that's what my friends, a lot of my family and all of us that kind of grew up together and knew each other, they were doing. Um, so that's just kind of how that came about. OK, so you once you graduated with your your business degree, but no knowledge in business, I guess. Right. That's besides graduate. Well, I'm finish. sure you learned something, but I, I didn't finish, though. Oh, you didn't finish? No, I didn't finish. I went for two and a half years. And like I said, I didn't finish uh, with with the business degree. That was just my major. Oh, OK. All right. And then what did you end up doing afterwards? So after I got into that, I worked at a warehouse job. It was a it was a packing plant. Um, so they had like different things uh, that they packed. And I worked in that uh, area for about two years. And I just kind of decided because I was still in my hometown at this time after I dropped out of college. And I was like, man, this is just, this isn't it. I don't I don't want to do this. Like because in in my hometown where I'm from, you worked at that place. And then there was two avenues that would happen. You would either eventually learn to sell drugs or do something to make a lot more money or you end up getting on it. So at a young age, I'm already down the path that a lot of people who move away and then end up coming back and they work at this facility because it was a call center and a packing plant that you worked at. There were good jobs and a few in between. And I was just like, man, this this ain't it. And so I ended up uh, packing up. I moved to the big city was what we call it, Oklahoma City and just kind of started building on from there. And um uh, you know, started doing that, uh, came here. I got another job working in a call center. That's how I got in the whole call center phase. So if you've heard some of my stories before, I always talk about call center and I reference that because I worked in, once you get in, it's like hard to get out of call center. Work. Yeah. And uh, that's what I did for probably the next uh, six years, maybe. And, uh, you know, eventually found my way into technology, which is, you know, really what my adult background was after I kind of got into that. Yeah, what company were you working for at the call center? Oh, uh, man, America Online, Sprint. Oh, old school. <laughs> yeah, people know American, American Online. <laughs> Which yo, one? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yo, they, they <laughs> dropped the ball, man. Out of all the companies, I mean, they had, like, they had the Corner world, market. man. And I, I cannot believe that it dropped the Corner ball. Corner of the market. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, with those, uh, with that path at that time, um, it wasn't union, right? It was, uh, it didn't, like, provide a pension or anything once you... No like retired nothing which is basically just working to nine to five and try, try to build up your own um your own wealth at were you saving a lot during that time or were you no. just kind of paycheck to paycheck no 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 man that uh, saving was not my middle name and nowhere in my vocabulary you know i consciously said i was saving money but you know that money would be gone by then i was paycheck to paycheck i wasn't good with money at all um you know overdraft king uh uh <laughs> check systems king i'm just being honest yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't anything like that at all. I mean, at this time, did you have a family or were you, were you? No, man? no, it was just me. It was just me at the time. You know, um, I didn't have a family, didn't have kids, anything like that. 
Yeah, so it makes it a little bit harder, right? One to really put money to the side and, and save because you know you're like like you said, you're you're in a small town at the time, but you moved to Oklahoma City. Um so how was that like once you moved to the city? Obviously you had like the 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 nine to five work at the call centers and stuff. Now you said you didn't like it, right? But you did it because that was the only skill you had at that time, right? Yeah, it paid well. Um it was the it was the only skill I had. It paid well. It was one of the things you could get into to make some pretty decent money without a degree. And if you excelled in it, you know, there was different bonuses. I worked in retention. So if you save people to keep their AOL account when they went to faster internet, <laughs> wasn't pile up anymore, they paid you pretty well. So yeah, I mean, it was just a, it was a good, uh, easy type of situation to get into. And it paid really well at that time for someone my age, you know, at the time. And it was just, you know, it was easy money and, and, and a really good career that you could excel in if you really wanted to do it. At what point did you decide to transition out of it? Because you said you went to tech, right? Yeah. So my last call center job was with a company called Dell. Dell. I mean, you know, Dell is Dell Computer. Yeah, yeah, the computer company. And um, I got a bunch of certifications from there, um, A plus, Network Plus, a couple Dell certs. And once I got it, I was like, wow, this is people started leaving and they're going into these other jobs, you know, because they had their A plus, which is a big thing if you're trying to get into IT. So I started, uh, you know, working with some of the uh, call center or excuse me, some of the uh, contract agencies. Uh, they ended up placing me at a company, um, which was my first IT job. I was super ecstatic about it. And that's how I was able to exit the call center field. And that's when I kind of entered the IT world. At what year was this around? Uh, 2007, eight. Somewhere around there. Oh, so you were early on in the IT field, man. That's ooh, so you were there before the, it really blew up. Because I, I noticed, like, probably the last six years or so was when I started really hearing about like IT the certs and stuff, right? Because in the IT field, it doesn't really matter as much. I won't say it doesn't really matter. It's smart to get a degree, of course, but I heard that in the IT field, the certs is what really matters certs yeah. and job experience that's really where you can excel the yes. degree is more just like a plus because you need those certs to do the job correct you do because those certs they're really going to test you to see if you really know what you know versus with a degree because i joined a degree program while i was in there because i wanted to get uh, my degree and um degree just kind of teaches you the the foundations really they really don't teach you any of the world world stuff at least from a couple of the programs that I had looked at or even got into. They just kind of teach you the fundamentals, the foundations, memorization more than anything than hands-on. The certifications, you know, that's more hands-on. You're going to be getting situational questions, troubleshooting questions. There's four right answers, but which one's the best one? I mean, it's much more, um, you know, it's much more intense. And so whenever you actually, you know, put that on your resume, people know that, hey, this person really must know their stuff because some of these certifications, man, they're really hard. Yeah. And say, which ones did you end up getting? Which out of all of them, which ones did you end up obtaining? Uh, so out of all of them, I mean, I attained my A plus, my network plus. Um, I had uh, an expired uh, MCP. Um, and then I had a couple of smaller like Dell ones. Dell had some of the ones that they had for just some of their desktops and stuff like that that I got. And then there was a couple off-brand ones. I say off-brand that you were kind of administrate over like certain systems like uh, DSX, which is a badge uh, reader software. I got certified in that. And um, I'm sure there's a couple others I can't remember, but those were the main ones. Which one do you recommend? Like if anybody who's listening who may be in the <clears throat> IT, which one do you think really provided the most value and, and money, really? Man, if you're going to make some money, I would, I would definitely say go after cloud certs right now. Um, go after cloud certs. Get your security plus. That's one of the most entry level security certifications that you can get. I would say go with like a security plus, get that um, and just kind of build on that uh, because cybersecurity right now is super hot. Um, yes, CCN, uh, CCNA uh, for your networking. That's really good. Network uh, network plus. But I think if you start with security plus and network plus, man, you could that's going to give you a really solid foundation to get in. All right. And how long did you work for Dell at that time? Um, just under a year, just under a year, probably about maybe nine, 10 months. Cause that, that's not the job that end up letting you go, right? No, no. Okay. So from Dell, you went to where? 
So from Dell, um, I got on a contract uh, with a uh, large um, hot, uh, a large uh, hotel chain, and I was on a contract with them. That contract ended, and uh, they were like, yo, we really love your work ethic. We don't have any jobs available here for, for IT, but we have one in payroll. And I've never done payroll before. My background's in IT, call centers, and working in a packing plant. So I didn't have any payroll experience. And I, and I was very transparent about that. It's like, listen, we love your attitude. We love your personality. Uh, we will train you. We will train you. We will let you come in um, and we'll give you all the training you need. So I was like, OK, benefits, discounts on this nice hotel, more money. You know, uh, I'm a newlywed at this point. So I'm like, why not? And uh, I got in and yeah, it, 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 that that was the 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 beginning of pretty much where I'm at today. <laughs> Beginning of the end, unfortunately. Yeah. That's kind of that's kind of messed up. So it's kind of like they gave you all that hope and then you went through the whole process and then it kind of had a sour ending. You don't have to name the, the company that you work for unless you want to. Yeah, I, 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 I'm probably not going to put it out there, but but I'll, I'll tell you the story of what happened. So the, this was a very large hotel chain, and my hotels were the Hawaii hotels. So, you know, Hawaii is like, I think, what, four hours behind us? So my shift was a little bit different. I didn't get a lot of training because of that. So what ended up happening was um, I wasn't getting a lot of training because when I, by the time I came in, people were like heavy into their own stuff. So I had some people that were like, yo, my deductions were off. My paycheck was different. I didn't have this. And I was always having to file like manual checks. And so what ended up happening was um, I went to my director before it became a problem. And I said, look, I'm really dropping the ball on a lot of stuff. I don't want to do that. I want to end up being good in this. I want to end up really like, I want to be good. I want to make a career out of this because I, you know, I really feel this could be my thing. Yeah, you want to and, excel. You want to excel because, you, like you said, you had a, you're a newlywed. You didn't have kids at that time, right? No, no. Yeah, no. and you were a newlywed, so you're like, this is a great opportunity. I want to make sure that I'm the best at this. Which, by the way, is everyone should do when you're in a job, right? You try That's to right. excel. So, right. sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're good. And so she looked me in my eye. I kid you not. She looked me in my eye and she told me. George, that's why we hired you, because you're you're honest, you're transparent. I love the fact that you came in here before it became a serious problem and you brought it to our attention. I'm going to get you all the training you need. This was on December 14th of 2009. December 15th, I went in. It literally felt like I was starting a new job because I felt like all this stress, like I'm going to get trained. Oh, this is going to be so great. And um, at the end of my shift, my supervisor says, George, you know, when you walk me out, you know, we're, we're getting ready to leave because it's later in the day. Because remember, my shifts are four hours later because of the Hawaii thing. So most people are gone at that point. So she said, before we go, I need to drop these papers off by HR. I said, OK, so I'm standing there by the uh, by the front door with my coat and bag ready to go. And then the HR director comes out and says, Mr. Pitts, are you ready? And I was like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. You ready? And she's kind of motioning me like you know, like, are you coming in, like coming to her office? And I was kind of looking and she was kind of like, let's go. And so I kind of walked in and I'm looking confused, like what's going on? So she sat down and she goes, okay. So, and she's looking down at the paperwork. So Mr. Pitts, I understand that you guys decided that it's best for you both to go your separate ways. You're separating from the company and that this just wasn't a good fit for you. And you're going to pursue other opportunities. I said, what? And she said, yeah, you're going to pursue other opportunities. I understand this is. And I was just like, I don't know what you're talking about, you know. And so she's like, well, tell me what's going on. Tell tell me, maybe, you know. And so I broke it. I told her the story I told you. And so she kind of went like this. She started rubbing her temples and she, you know, put her glasses down. She's like, OK, Mr. Pitts, I'm going to level with you. We live in an at will state. Do you know what that is? I said, no, you know, what does that mean? She's like, that means that you can be terminated for any reason as long as it's not against your race or anything that could be discriminatory and there's no recourse. I said, OK, she's like, you could either say this was a mistake. It was, you know, you didn't mean that and you want to do it here and they will just let you go tomorrow or you could 
take a resignation. I'll give you two extra paychecks and you could be rehirable. But that's the best I can do for you. I would advise you to take the latter. And I'm sitting there like, what just happened? Like, it, it, it just it seemed like it happened so fast. So I said, well, I guess I'll take the latter, you know, because I needed an extra check. I'm living paycheck to paycheck already. So she's like, here's what I need you to do. And she, you know, grabbed a sheet of paper and she gave me a pen and she slid it over. She's like, everything you just told me, I need you to put that in your exit interview so I can send that to corporate. And I need you to be as detailed as possible. And I said, oh, OK. And, you know, I sat down, wrote everything down in detail. And that was it. And, man, I just remember walking to my car and getting goosebumps thinking about it, feeling like I was less of a man because I just lost my job. I'm living paycheck to paycheck already. I just got married to my wife, promised her dad I would take care of her. Now I'm about to go home two weeks before Christmas and tell her I don't have a job. So I'm confused. If she brings you into office as if you said it was not a fit for you. Correct. So was there some sort of miscommunication at some point? Did someone did someone say something to her? The director that... and the manager told her that. And they pretty much set us up. From the way that she her reaction was and everything like that, she literally believed that. And my reaction of knowing, not knowing what she was talking about, they put us in a room on two separate things and kind of eased their way out. Because the director didn't come. My supervisor or my, my manager at the time, she dropped the papers off and then she said she was going to the restroom and, and left. And it was just me. You know, that's when the HR director was like, hey, you know, you ready, Mr. Pitts? And I was like, ready, you know. And I literally tell you, still to this day, that's one of the most frustrating things that ever happened to me. It's, I get angry still talking about it. Yeah, because that sounds kind of messed up because obviously it was also right before Christmas. <clears throat> 14 days before or 10 days before. I'm trying to figure out if you could have gone back, right? Do you think you would have done something a little bit differently? Because it seems like you were kind of, it was, it was sprung on you. She has this one, I guess, viewpoint of what's happening. You're resigning, right? You're saying it's, it's not a fit. You're confused. You're like, wait a, wait a second. Yeah. I, I, I guess I'll take this, this two paychecks and resign. But where, what happened after that? So like you just you left and that was it. Ties were cut. You never went back. You never you never called and was like, no. I think there might be some sort of miscommunication. Something must have happened. It no. was just done. That was it. I didn't. I mean, you know, man, I'm I'm like 21, 22 at the time. I don't know any law. She just told me if I came back the next day and said it was a miscommunication, they'll just fire me. Now knowing what I know and knowing I was never going to go back to that company anyway. I probably would have took that and got my unemployment. But in my mind, I'm oh, thinking, yeah, because they could have, because well, is this it's a resignation at that point? So I can't find it. Yeah. But I didn't know, like I said, I'm young, man. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm just thinking, I'm going to get two extra checks. At least I've got some time to figure this out. But I didn't have any recourse after that. All I kept thinking about was that if I come back tomorrow and they fire me, there's nothing I could do. I, I get whatever is left to me and I'm not going to get paid. And I got to find a job quick. And again, like I said, imagine that. And I, like I said, I didn't know what my recourses were. I didn't know that George just filed unemployment, but I didn't know that. So, you know, I'm just sitting there really just trying to process what's happening. Cause all this man is happening in a span of 10 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you process that as a newlywed living paycheck to paycheck that you just got this job, what, two, maybe three months ago? Like there was so much to process Christmas. I mean, I wasn't thinking clear, but if I could go back, you asked me, what would I do different? I would have took the termination and found unemployment and rode that out. That's kind of, <clears throat> I'm kind of angry hearing your story over and over. Like I said, I've heard it before. I just, Man, it it's just shocking because it also seems a little bit like the lady who terminated you seemed like she had a little bit of an attitude, right? Kind of well, like 
you're talking about the HR director? Yes. It wasn't an attitude towards me. I truly believe, and I don't know the truth. Okay, I don't. I don't know if she knew it or what. But in my opinion, I think she was mostly frustrated because she didn't know. And they made it seem like we had had a discussion already that this was the best thing for both of us. When I was saying, no, we just talked yesterday. They trained me today. I'm feeling good. Like, I, I'm thinking everything is cool. Like, what are you talking about? Are you sure you got the right person? Like, she's tripping out that I had no idea about this. And she's literally been told, it seems like, from the way it was presented to me again, I don't know what all they talked about. But from her expression and the way it seemed like everything went down, I really feel to this day that she didn't know. And so she explained what she explained to me, and that was it. But again, you know, they could have all been in cahoots and it was just a game. I don't know. Yeah, that's got to be frustrating. Um, and who knows what, what the plan was. Maybe they found someone else they were trying to replace you with or something. Who who knows? Who knows? At that time, did your wife have a job at all? She had just started uh, MA school, but she had an agency job. Uh, where she could go and pick up hours because she works in the healthcare field. Um, and I remember the next day, that's when she actually went and took, um, you know, a, an extra shift because we were going to need that money. Yeah. And I can only imagine, like you said, as, as a man who just, just got married, you know, you, you take those vows and you're like, I'm going to take care of you. We're going to, we're going to be a family. I got a good job. This is going to be great. And within just like this, your entire vision i'm sure which was probably i'm gonna work at this company i'm gonna be amazing i'm gonna do all this great stuff right just gone just like that just like that so what was going on in your mind going from that point when you got in the car to getting home like did you run that conversation through your mind how you're gonna break this to your wife uh or did you i mean did you just call her up was like yo i just got fired no, uh, I called my father-in-law first. <laughs> I called really? him. Yeah. And I said, uh, I got to talk to you. He says, everything okay? I said, I just lost my job. He said, what happened? And I told him what was going on. This is on my way home. I'm on the phone with him. And he's like, we'll be, we'll, we'll be at the house, you know, so when you tell you know, your wife, you know, we'll make sure everything is good. But he's like, just know we got your back. And to this day, I don't know why I called him first, but I'm glad I did because I felt a lot better. But I think it was just because of what I had promised him about I was going to take care of his daughter. I felt I, I really don't know what I felt. I'm going to be I'm not going to sit up here and say I felt like as a man, I should call him like I'm, I'm not going to sit up here in front. I, I don't know. I just was led to call him and tell him what happened. And I just wanted to see what his response was going to be. I don't know, but I'm really glad I did it. So once you got home, he, they were there. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I got to ask, did he get there before you or did you get there first? No, they got there. <laughs> I got there first. Okay, because that'd be <laughs> they awkward. Showed about, like, they, Why showed you here, Dad? <laughs> they showed up about 10 minutes later. They got there right after me. Okay. Um, we, we had about the same distance of a drive home. Okay. Uh, so they got there right after me. And, uh, you know, I just remember my wife sitting there saying, we're going to be fine. You know, I'm going to pick up a ship tomorrow um, and uh, we're going to get through this. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, I promised your dad I'd go to school and all this other stuff. And they were like trying to calm me down. Like, you need to relax, like take a breath. It's going to be fine. Like, you know, you guys got a lifetime to, to put this together. Don't feel like you got to figure this all out today and don't feel like you're going to be alone. And that was like, that's when I knew I married right. <laughs> But I also knew that uh, I wasn't alone because that's how I really have always kind of lived life. Um, it's just feeling like I've always got to figure it out by myself because I've always had. So it was really reassuring. That's good to hear that it wasn't like that complete opposite effect, right? Like, what are we going to do? Like, what, yeah. what do you mean you lost your job? Like, yeah. like we, don't, we don't even have money to pay the bills. So I, I wasn't sure what to expect, man. I'm a newlywed at this point. So, yeah. you, you know, you're still figuring each other out. So <laughs> I, I'll be honest. I wasn't sure what to expect, but <laughs> like, uh, like, it, it, it ended up being a lot better than what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. So uh, during your, your tire, obviously you're distraught at that point, right? Um, your mindset, 
right because this is the this is the point where it's going to come down to whether it's going to make you or break you right you can either sit in your misery and be sad and just mope all day and complain like why me why me or you could start figuring things out did you go through that phase at all where it was like why me why me so i'll tell you what i went through the next morning uh, we didn't have remote start so the next morning uh my wife was picking up a shift from 7a to 7p you know that's what you worked in the medical field and while she was getting ready and when she would go early i would always go sit in her car and let it warm up while she's getting ready because again we didn't have a remote start none of that so i'm sitting in there um she comes out you know i give her a kiss and she says you know i'll see you later and I remember as I was watching her car lights and I couldn't see her tail lights anymore when she pulled out of the apartments. I remember sitting there thinking my wife is going to work to take care of me. And I walked back in the house. I still had my jacket on, my shorts, my flip flops. I laid in bed. It's about six in the morning, 615. So it's still dark. And literally, I remember laying there and just looking out the window from it getting dark to where it was sunlight. And I remember I just heard this voice like, get up, go figure it out. And so the first thing that you think when you lose a job and that's all you're used to having to pay your bills is let me get up. And what do you think I did? Start applying for jobs. But if you know anything about, you know, companies hiring, most companies are not hiring during the holidays, you know, like for a good job. Yeah, it's like off season. Are, they're, they're on, you know, Christmas break. They're not doing any of that. So I'm applying for jobs like crazy. I'm going on Craigslist, Career Builder. You know, those were the spots back then. Monster. Mm -hmm. um, and just filling out applications like a madman. No one's calling. And so then I just started looking up, you know, how to make money online, how to get it, how to how to get an Internet jobs. And I stumbled across this website called Warrior Form. And Warrior Form is like the OG of Internet marketing. When you talk about the origins of funnels and ads and optimization, it came from there because they taught you SEO backlinks and all that. I mean, there was guys like Russell Brunson on there and uh, the guy that did uh, every webinar, all those like big marketers you guys know now, they were on the site. And that's where I learned about how to build uh, WordPress websites. I learned about you can start a business building websites for people, then you can charge them $100 a month to do SEO. And so I just started, you know, learning about this. I'm like, wow, this is incredible. Then I stumbled across a website called Work at Home Moms. Uh, WHM dot, I don't remember, it wasn't dot com, it was something else, but it was work at home moms, W A H M. And I was like, it was probably maybe 10 men on that site. And I learned about getting work at home jobs. And so during the holidays, I ended up learning how to get a work at home job. I worked for Best Buy and Home Shopping Network, HSN, during the Christmas break. And that's where you take calls, you know, hey, your order's on the way, or we just checked UPS's site, it's three days away, or there's a delay. Those were the kind of calls I had. And that's what really kind of kept us. You know what I'm saying? So my wife wouldn't have to leave school and go back to work to full time. That really kept us. It was tight because I wasn't making enough, but I was working two of them. And, um, you know, once I got out of that and the, the holiday break was over, I started getting calls in February and uh, was able to get uh, my next job, which was uh, in IT for um, another company. And I was there accelerated for, you know, 10 years. But. I made a promise to myself. And what that promise was, is I said, I will never let someone control 100% of my income again. And so when I took that job, I worked that work at home job for 18 months. So I worked from 7 a.m. to 4, or excuse me, no, uh, 7 to 3. And I would literally get off, come home and work from 5 to 9, like six days a week. And just wanting to save. And that's when I really got intentional about saving and putting money back, having other streams of income. And literally that's when I got hit by that entrepreneur bug and just making more money. So I'm sorry, you were saying that you, so you get off at 3 PM and then from five to nine, you were doing your side hustle. Right. Which was the work at home jobs. I was still doing it. Got you. So you were doing the work at home jobs and right. stuff like that. Um, okay. You know, I, it just clicked with me where I saw you. Cause you said you learned about like WordPress and stuff. That's when I end up actually coming across you uh, on YouTube. 
because I started a whole digital marketing business as well. And I was looking, watching a whole bunch of videos and I had five clients I realized I hated it. <laughs> to be honest, like I, it was, it was, it was, yo, SEO is like one of the toughest things <sighs> to do. Uh, and then, you know, obviously then I realized that most agencies actually outsource that. So they do. Then, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's when I got into that and, and started outsourcing. But I actually, the only, cause there's so many different things you could do in digital marketing, right? What I realized I did like was at least the social media aspect of things. So I still have two clients that I, that I keep on, but it's more like a barter system because I just don't want to give all my time to mm -hmm. doing that. But I, I, it's it sounds very easy, and I'm sure you can attest to this, where it's like, oh, just build websites and just to sell it. It's a, it's a lot harder, especially sure. WordPress. WordPress is not always user-friendly, so it's it's... <laughs> It's pretty interesting, but you said you got struck by the um, entrepreneur bug. At what point did you start, I guess, your official first business? Because were you like selling websites and stuff on the side yes. as well during yeah. that time? Uh, yeah. when, when did you start, I guess, scaling back on your nine to five job as well as the stay at home jobs? At what point did you start pivoting away from that? So with the at-home jobs, when I was still I was still going on Warrior Forum at this time. Now the HSN job was going to be ending um, that later that year uh, in October, and then they were going to bring me back in December, um, late November, early December, to do the holiday season again. And then they keep you on if your performance is good for six months after that. The Best Buy one I kept, and I ended up getting another one with AT and T. And so I started scaling back on that whenever I actually bought this training to learn how to build WordPress websites because it sounded cool, but I, I, I didn't I'm not a developer. I didn't have experience doing it. You just don't, you know, you you, you learn it. So uh, that's when I learned about uh, WordPress websites, um, doing Internet marketing, SEO and building backlinks and writing blogs that have a lot of keywords in it, keyword planners and all that kind of stuff. And that's when I started scaling back from the uh, work at home jobs when I got my first client, which was an attorney um, building their website. And that attorney, after I finished it, they started telling other attorneys. And so I started getting these referrals. And then I developed a system that I learned about using Craigslist services area, uh, Googling sites on Google to see what sites don't have a website that's on Google, even though the business is there. And then I started learning how to get jobs. Um, and then so I was like, yo, I'm making way more money building websites. I don't need to do this work at home thing anymore. And that's when I kind of hung that up and moved on into um, building websites and doing that on the side. But then, as you know, I mean, if you built them before, it takes a lot of time. A lot. A lot of time. So I was coming home and I was working on a website at five. And I look up, it's 11, almost 12 o'clock. I'm like, damn, you know what I'm saying? And so then you submit that stuff to clients. They're wanting you to change it. Can you add this page? Can you put this color on there? Can you throw this picture? And so it ended up being long. And I was like, man, there's got to be a better way. And that's when I learned about a site called Odesk, which is where you could go and, and hire people, outsource different people. So I started finding other WordPress designers that were overseas um, and I developed a system where I paid them to build the site. They would deliver it if it was something off or something that I knew the client wanted that they didn't do right. I knew enough to where I could make that change really quick. Then I would introduce it to the client. And that's how I was able to keep that going without driving myself insane and work a crazy amount of hours with the nine to five in addition to that. Yeah, it also gives you opportunity to scale as well, Yes, which is, which is great. Yeah, I, I learned that quickly as well. So I have a real estate photography business. So that's like my other job, my actual, like a business that I own. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember at first, when I first started, I would just shoot one house a day. I would come home, I would spend hours editing and then delivering the photos. Then I quickly realized, well, I couldn't find an editor, shoot more houses to drop the photos off. They do the hard work and then I deliver to the client. I did go. that for a while. Americans, they charge way too much. So <laughs> some, some guy from India reached out to me and I was like, let me, let me see, let me see work. I sent them um, some photos and they delivered it within 24 hours. The quality was 10 times better. 
and 10 <laughs> times cheaper. And that's when <laughs> like my business really started um, taking off at that time. Yeah. I was able to scale. I was able to shoot three, four houses. And I, I was still in the military that time as well. So I was doing my military job and then I would go and I would shoot a few houses or on my day off, I would just spend all day shooting houses. But that's a great way to scale. And I learned that as well, like you said, in digital marketing, where I'm sitting there spending hours doing a WordPress website and then realizing later on, oh, most of these companies, they outsource. That's the, that's the best way to do it. You have to know what you're doing, but if you want to scale, you have to outsource it and then just do the tweaks and then deliver it to the clients. What Do you remember what you charged your first client? <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, I responded to an ad. So basically someone on Craigslist the way my system worked was I would go on the services page of Craigslist. You know, there's like legal, plumbing, you know, all these categories. So on this particular day, I was calling attorneys. And what I would do is I would call and act like I wanted more information and ask them if they had a website. And I would say, hey, you know, I want to find more information about your services. I'm a website guy, so I love to look at websites because I design them. Do you happen to have a website? I can go and get more information. I mean, dude, I'm calling like divorce attorneys. I'm calling uh estate planning attorney like all kind of attorneys so i'm sure my wife's like why are you got all these you know and so one particular lady answered and you know she's like no i don't have a website but i'm really interested in learning more about getting a website done that was what i wanted them to say mm -hmm. so we scheduled to go out to her office and i had no plan on what i was going to charge i didn't even know what i was going to charge i just wanted to get a client so i'm sitting up there i'm going i'm on her chalkboard she had a chalkboard what whiteboard that <laughs> you know i'm breaking down what i can do for her and then she you know she's looking at her watch and she's like <sighs> you know she you could just tell like with her body language she didn't want to be there and i was like man this is not going good at all so she said mr pitts i've got a 230 i've got this going on i got that how much are you going to charge me to build this website i said well it depends you know if you want this you want that so and she sits now she grabs her purse she puts it up and like she's about to walk out she opens her purse, pulls out her checkbook, puts out her pen, and she said, Mr. Pitts, how much do you charge? Because I don't have time. You can get this over to my paralegal. She'll get you everything you need. Just tell me how much it's going to cost. I said, uh, um, and I think I said like six or seven hundred dollars cheap. And I remember she went, hmm. Okay. <laughs> Here you go. Talk to her. I got to run. I probably could have told that lady two or three thousand dollars and she would have wrote the check. But yeah, I yeah, you, yeah, you probably you probably could have. I, same same situation. My very first client, same thing. Like how much? Uh, uh, five five hundred dollars. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so was I was like, like includes everything. It includes the yeah. domain name. Includes this. I was That's like, what I said I start throwing in all these bonuses. Like yeah. I'm gonna get your domain name. I'm gonna get your hosting. Uh, I'm gonna do your you know first couple months of SEO. Like I'm mm -hmm. all this unnecessary stuff. Un yeah, she and she didn't know what any of that was. She just wanted to know a number so she could get back to her day. Yeah, but it ended up leading to referrals to yeah, other clients. It paid for itself. That's great. Several times over. All right. Several and, times over. And so that's that was like your main like side hustle to end up becoming your kind of your main source of income at that point. No, I was still working a full time job, but I was making more doing websites because I would do about three websites a month, averaging anywhere from eight hundred to a thousand dollars. So I'm making a little bit more in websites than I was my actual full time job at the time. And um, what happened was when the iPhone 4S came out, you remember the 4S, right? The security. We're talking about way, yeah, way, <laughs> way back then. Ago. Yeah. Well, I was the Galaxy. I was the same. I was a, an Android guy for years. And so yeah, same. Uh, we made like we had these two websites that I finished and I was like, man, we should get iPhones like these S's are really cool because the guys in my job had them. I'm working in tech. So, you know, we nerd out on that stuff. So I was like, I told my wife, I was like, we should do the iPhone next to me. This thing's really cool. So we was like, yeah. So we went and bought them, right? So we had a whole bunch of, we had the Galaxy S1, the S2. I think the last one I had was the S3. And so the next day, a couple weeks later or something, I don't remember how long, uh, we were sitting there and me and a coworker was talking. I was like, um, and I was like, yeah, I need to, before my lunch is over, I need to go put these phones on Craigslist real quick. He's like, what phones? I was like, man, we got a dresser drawer full of like, Androids. I'm going to put, we got an S3. We've got two S3s. They were still kind of new. I think the S4 was out, so they were still had some value. I said, man, I'm going to go throw them on Craigslist real quick. Um, he's like, no, nah, man, you need to put them on eBay. It's like, what? Does anybody even still use eBay anymore? He's like, you would be, you'll get more money on eBay for those phones than if you put them on Craigslist. I'm like, you serious? He's like, man, whenever I sold our, our iPhone 3GSs, because he had a 4S. 
He's like, I put them on on eBay and I made quite a bit of money. So I was like, okay. Well, I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll check it out later on when I get home. So I listed them on Craigslist. Um, but I was like, when I get home, I'm gonna see who all emailed. And then when I got home, I decided to go on um, eBay. And I was like shocked at what those phones were going for. They were like, it was like double. Like I had them listed for eighty dollars a piece on Craigslist. They're going for like two forty, two fifty on eBay. And I'm like, what the heck? So I listed both of the phones on there. Well, I listed mine first, and I like finished getting it on there, turned the light out, and I'm getting ready to go to bed and get ready to take a shower. And then my phone goes off. Like 30, 45 minutes later, I'm talking to my wife and doing some other stuff, getting ready for bed. And it's sold. I was like, what? So I was like, yo, yo, where's your other phone? Where's your phone? She's like, it's over there in the nightstand. So I ran over to her nightstand, got it, you know, listed. You know, I was like, I got to list this in the morning, but I got to package this up. I went in here, printed off the, the, the stuff. I'm just like excited. I can't believe it. And then I listed her phone the next day, and her phone sold like later that day, same price. I was like, we just made almost $500 off of two phones we were going to sell for less than 200 each. I mean, like total. And I was like, man, I wonder if I could start buying phones off Craigslist really cheap and selling them on eBay. And that became like my next big. That, yo, hustle. you had that side hustle mentality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, did it, and did it work? Oh, man, did it work? I ended up buying every phone I could get my hands on on eBay. And I started with just Android. Mm -hmm. But then what I learned was that the, the iPhones were selling for even more money. So I did this for the better part of nine months. And then the iPhone, I think the iPhone 6 came out next. I can't remember what the one that came out next. And so the, four, the iPhone 4, which is not the 4S, but the 4s, people were listing those on Craigslist for like 50 to 100 bucks. They were going on eBay for like 300 at the time. I'm like, What? So I started buying them like crazy and listing them. And then what happened was I started finding them. I found a loophole. So there's a part on um, Craigslist that just or eBay that just came out called make an offer. And it's something they hadn't had before. You check this box and all these listings that have a make an offer option come up. So I stumbled upon it and I just happened to type in I, uh, Apple iPhone 4 because I wanted to see how much people were selling them for on that. So I was going to see, are they selling them for more money? But I ended up finding a gold mine. They were selling them for less on this one. Like they were listing them for like 150 with make an offer. So I was like making an offer of 100, 125, and they were taking it. So then I would get these phones and then I would relist them on Craigslist for 300 and they were selling. And I said, oh my God. So it got so crazy that I would order the phones. When I got the shipping and the tracking number they were on their way, I relisted them immediately. And I would sell them sometimes before they even got to my house. So my question about that, though, that's kind of strange. Did those people not catch on that they could have done the same thing? I guess not. <laughs> uh, were you, were, you weren't ever at one point worried that you might just end up with a bunch of phones you couldn't sell? Yeah, I was. I'm not going to lie to you. And it was the time whenever I ordered 10, um, I think I spent about $1,800 and I got 10 and um, I got really, really, really scared because then it kind of slowed down a little bit. And I, $1,800 at the time was a lot of money to me because we, we still didn't have a lot of money, even though we were making money from multiple things. We still weren't, you know, saving a lot of money, even though we were learning. But I got I got burned. And I don't think I've ever told this story. So there's a site called liquidation.com that I was buying stuff in bulk from. And there was a lot on there of 50 iPhone 4s. They were all lit up, everything, for uh, I think it was $2,200 or $2,300. It was, it was a pretty high price. But I couldn't believe how cheap they were because I'm like, I'm going to make a lot of money off of this. They're all lit up. Everything looks good. I'm like, man, this is going to be great. Even if the the um, ES was the ESN numbers or ESID, I can't remember the serial number. Even if they're bad, I can sell them for half, and I'm still going to make a profit. So I get them. They light up for like five seconds, and they turn off. I'm like, what the heck? Next one, same thing. Next one, same thing. I'm like, what the? What is? You know? 
So I took it to a store. I took five of them to a store. I had this huge box, but I took five of them to a store. And I was like, I need you guys to check out these phones. I can't get them to come back on. So then they check them, they check them, and they call me back the next day. They said, Mr. Pitts, uh, we, we're not going to be able to fix these phones. I was like, why? It was like, the logic boards are damaged. I was like, what do you mean? It's like someone basically took it apart, drilled a hole in every logic board. Damn. And I said, what is the logic board? They said, that's the main thing of the iPhone. All these phones have a hole in the you're there you are you are not gonna get nothing out of these phones. Like you we we can't fix this. And I remember I was like, well shit, I'll get my money back. So I got on liquidation.com, contacted support. All sales are final. I said, What do you mean this is bad? Like literally the logic boards are bad. Like they someone intentionally opened these phones, drilled a hole on all these. These phones are worthless. They wouldn't do it. I an attorney, had them send a letter, it's ironclad. Everything that you buy on that site is as is. And I will never forget that. And that's whenever I was like, crap. And I was ready. I was like, I was so mad, but I knew my system worked. So I went back to mine, but it took me a little bit to recover. Cause that first of all, it was a lot of money that I put into them. I just had these things sitting there and literally I couldn't get rid of them. I ended up uh, offering them. They have these, these iPhone they don't have them anymore, but they used to have these iPhone vending machines that you could sell your phone to. And I think I was getting like maybe $10 for each one. I just wanted to get something. And um, they were pretty much like these iPhone recycling things. And they would examine it. If it worked, they'd give you an offer, which was still really cheap. And if it didn't work and wouldn't power on, they gave you like 5 or $10 or something like that. Like they had them in Walmart areas targets uh some some convenience i remember so you basically had to eat that you had to eat that cost i had to eat, you know, that, I had to eat that cost yeah that was a that was a, the most sour piece of humble pie i've ever had wow that's messed up man does that website still exist yeah yeah a lot of people use it for their e-commerce courses man, now. y'all owe george money man y'all owe <laughs> him <laughs> you owe him money uh, man that. i i haven't done business with that site since then man and i actually bought other stuff off of there leading up to that mm -hmm. um you know i was always scouring stuff from my ebay store but uh man i haven't done business with that site since then yeah that's messed up um so at what point did you actually completely quit all the jobs and you end up working for yourself? That was uh, early last year. Um, you know, I put uh, put in my notice. Now, I quit all the side jobs and all that other stuff in 2018 uh, or 19, as far as that. I just had my full-time job, had my eBay store, and I started doing some, some coaching and teaching people how to do eBay um, as well. Uh, but I went in full-time entrepreneurship for myself in 2021. Congratulations. So when you say you were doing the coaching and stuff, so you didn't mention, I, I heard you, I, I know you were almost running out of time here. Um, now, I know that you said that you bought a course and that's what taught you how to do like the, the website building and stuff like that. Um, what made you decide to start coaching? So there was an app called Periscope. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It was a live stream. Oh, I remember them. Yeah, it's I the remember OG. Periscope. It was the OG of uh, live streaming. In my opinion, it's still the best live streaming app out, even though it's not around anymore. So uh, I actually went to a friend's giving and uh, we were actually sitting around, you know, about to uh, fry this turkey. And the guy that was hosting it said, hey, George, take my phone and video me about to drop this turkey. So I was like, OK, so he gives me the phone and I'm seeing like all these hearts. And I'm like, what is this? He said, oh, it's an app, man. It's people from all over. And like someone's like bonjour, and you know, you know, such, this such stuff from UK, this such from this. I was like, man, somebody said bonjour. Someone, this person said uh, such and such six two five says what's up from the UK. Such and such says what's up from Canada. Like, oh, what's up, man? And so I was like, I was really intrigued by this app. Like you connect with all these people in the world, and you can just like show what you're doing. So what happened was I was on this app, and you know, all these people at the time were like. You know, I'm a coach and, uh, you know, I, I do courses and sign up for my my training and sign up for this. And I'm like, what? Is, you know, like it was that stuff was foreign to me, um, the way they were doing it. And so I, I, I was intrigued, but I wasn't sure about. So what I started doing was I just would go on there and just kind of show my day. So like when shipments were coming in, because I was ordering stuff from overseas at the time, off like Alibaba and some of those sites for my store. So when those things would come in, I would show like my shipment of all this stuff I was getting in. 
Um, I was showing when I was going, I was doing live streaming when I had these big boxes and baskets that I'm taking into the post office to send off. And I just started building a following on there. And then I just kept getting hit up. Like, do you coach? Do you have a course on this? Are you going to be doing a live training on this? Some of the stuff that those other people were saying that I was seeing, and I had never done any of that before uh, on for myself, you know, and I had bought a training, but it wasn't the way they positioned it wasn't the same as it was on Warrior Forum. But um, so anyway, I was like, man, so, so many of these people are like asking me, man, I really like, need to take this serious. And I'll tell you something, man, I'm so glad that I didn't do it the hustle way, meaning that, hey, let's jump on a Skype call, PayPal me this much, and I'll teach you everything I know about eBay. What I did was I started watching these people that were that I was watching before that was talking about their training, their coaching. And I came across the guy named Kelly James. And I was like, uh, he would come on every day at the same time. He would give about 30, 45 minutes of value. He would, you know, pitch, just lightly pitch his training that he that he did. And then he would get off. He wasn't salesy like everybody else. He wasn't flashy. And when he came on, he wasn't just like, you need to do this. And you need to like he was giving you value. So I sent him a message and I said, hey, I know you because he was a sales coach. He just taught people how to do better with sales and how to close. I was like. I know you're a sales coach and you teach that, but I, you know, that's not really what I'm looking to learn. I kind of want to learn. I don't know how to ask this, but I want to learn how to do what you do. Do you have something or, you know, do you have a program where I can learn how to like do a, a training or a coaching course or yeah, I didn't know what to call it at the time. And he was like, he wrote me back and said, I've never had anybody ask me that before. Let me think about it. And uh, then a day later he wrote me back. He said, I'll tell you what, I've got another cohort coming up. Um, and it was in, uh, in April of 2016, I think at the time. And he said, if, you know, this is how much it's going to cost, uh, I'll add you to that cohort, but instead of teaching you on sales, me and you will have one-on-ones and I'll teach you how to set up your systems, how to develop your, your, uh, your, your coach, your, your, your program, how to price it, how to list it, how to collect payments, all that stuff. And that's how I got into it. And uh, my very first training that I did was my eBay masterclass. And man, that changed every changed everything for me. Because uh, from what I remember, on one, one of your videos, you were saying that um, did you charge pretty small for that very first? Small. Yeah. And then please tell my audience what you learned from that. <laughs> so um, I, I ended up launching it, and I launched it initially for ninety seven dollars. And so I remember the uh, my uh, coach at the time was like, you know, hey, you know, did you get the courses? I said, yeah, man, you know, I got three sales. Like, I'm excited because I had never done like, you know, this was different from eBay. And he was like, how much you how much you listed for? I was like, ninety seven dollars. He said, do me a favor. Take that down. I said, OK. So I thought I did something wrong. I thought it was listed wrong. So I took it down. And I was like, what's going on? He's like, man, you need to put five hundred dollars in that course. I said, what? He said, you need to put that course back and charge $500 for it. I was like, man, I'm not putting $500 on you. You crazy? Like, you know, like, you trying to not get me to get any sale? I just got three. He's like, you're about to teach people how to make several hundred, if not thousands of dollars a month. I helped you build this. Like, I know what this, this thing's about. It's going to take off. But you can't sell this for $97. They won't respect it. You know, you, you can't do that. So I, we went back and forth and he said, if you don't change the price on this, I won't work with you as a coach again. So I said, how about this? How about halfway? We do 250. He said 300 or he said 297. I was like, OK. So I listed it for 297. I had 13 people sign up literally that same day. And I ended up getting a total of 26 people. And I got so scared because I got imposter syndrome. I never made that much money in that little. I've never seen that much money in an account I own in my life. It was like over six thousand dollars. And I took it down and I started getting messages on Friday. This was Wednesday when I put it up initially. Thursday, I had got up to 26. I took it down on Friday. I started getting messages from people like, hey, I'm trying to go and register for your course. And it says it's not available. Can you send me a link? I really want to get into it. I just got paid today. I said, we're sold out. <laughs> and they were like, sold out? Well, when is your next one? I was like, I, I don't know, but I'll, I'll announce it later. But right now we're at capacity. He said, man, I really wanted to be in it, man. I just, I, I, I was like, I'm sorry. And I was, I had imposter syndrome. 
And what happened was I ended up doing the course. It was live. I did it on a, on that the, the Friday evening. Everybody was stoked. They were like so excited. They set up that they set up their eBay's while we were on this on this Zoom. Like it was a two and a half hour, almost three hour training, and I didn't even get through the rest of it. And I said, "Okay, what do you guys think?" They said, "Oh man, this was so good. I got so much stuff in my house. I'm already looking at everything I'm going to sell. I can't wait to list this stuff tonight." And I said, "Okay, so if you guys are good, we can come back tomorrow at twelve, and I'll talk to you guys. I'm going to teach you guys about drop shipping." And they said, "Wait, there's more." I was like, yeah, you know, I, I didn't get to talk about drop shipping tonight, but I want to make sure you guys learn about that. And they were like, wow, you know, this is great, man. This was so great. I can't, we'll, I'll be here. I'll be, everybody, was like, I'll be there. One lady was like, I'm calling in. I have to work on Saturday, but I will be there. And everybody came on that Saturday. I talked till two o'clock about drop shipping, um, got off. I didn't touch that money for like a month and a half. Because you weren't sure if they were going to like. Because <laughs> I wasn't sure if they were going to ask for refunds. For refunds, me. yeah. The only reason I spent it was because one of the ladies sent me a message and said, George, I'm freaking out. I don't have any more inventory. That Christmas rush that you said is here. I need to get some stuff to sell. But my husband says I can't sell any more stuff in the house. And there's not there's no more garage sales. during the. What can I do? And I said, remember, we talked about arbitrage. This is something I just got into. And I said, you remember, I told you guys I was going to add some videos about arbitrage. And I, I told her what to do. I said, you know. Go over here to Marshalls. Do you got a Marshalls? Do you got TJ Maxx? Do you got these? She's like, yeah, I got all those. I said, go there, download the eBay app. All the things that have tags, scan those tags. Whatever they're going for on eBay, if you can get them for half or less, get them. She wrote me back like 45 minutes later, and she sent me a picture of all this stuff she had bought. She's like, you just saved my my, uh, Christmas rush because I always talked about the Christmas rush. She's like, I'm about to list this stuff. Thank you so much. Your course was great. I would have paid $1,000 for it if you told me. And that shifted everything for me. And we had a really good Christmas that year. And literally, that was really the start of me transitioning from side hustler to businessman because I was like, I got to take this serious. And that's what I did. And that's when you stepped into base, the, the coaching and everything. But where did you get the name um, Mr. Monetize Everything? Because that's a catchy name. Like, that's, <laughs> yo, congratulations on that name. That's, that, that's catchy. How did you get that? So, I went by Mr. George Pitts on all platforms, right? But every time I would finish a, um, every time I would finish going live on Periscope and eventually transition to Instagram, I would always say monetize everything. And I'd say, until next time, everybody, if you're if uh, you take care of your money, your money will take care of you. Until next time, go out there and monetize everything. Because I taught people how to get work at home jobs, how to build websites, how to get into eBay, and so I created that moniker, monetize everything, you know, get you a nine to five, get you a working home job, use that money to, to, to buy like hosting and websites and do design, use that money and, and, and buy stuff for your eBay store, monetize everything. That's what I always said. So I lost, I built my Instagram up. Uh, I started on Instagram when I went to FinCon in 2018, because everybody was like, what's Periscope? You know, do you have an Instagram? So I finally got on Instagram. I built my following up from 2018 to May of 2021 to 51,000 followers. Now, every time I would go into lives or IG lives or anything, they'd be like, there's George Pitts. That's I call him Mr. Monetize Everything, but there's Mr. George Pitts. Well, my account got taken in May of 2021 because an imposter, uh, I'm sure you probably had this with your account. I basically, one, yep. yeah, and they, they basically sent a whole bunch of report bots and um, had my account flag, which I later found out someone actually paid someone to do it. And because another person of mine uh, happened to them. So I lost my account. So after fighting for over almost a month trying to get it back, Facebook wouldn't give it back. So I was like, I've got to I've got to start over. So uh, I was trying to think of a name. I, I tried George Pitts. It was already taken. I was like, oh, I could do George Pitts Cola. It's the name of my company. I don't want to do that. And I was, you know, the website wasn't available. Then I looked at, I started doing these things. And I said, what about if I just start a brand, monetize everything? That was taken. <laughs> so I remember I went uh, around this time, Clubhouse that came on. So I started going on Clubhouse. And one of the guys came in and says, George Pitts just got here. I'm so glad you're on Clubhouse. I call him Mr. Monetize Everything. And it just like went off. Like, George, that's it. I had been called that by people, but I was like, that's it. And I went on Instagram real quick. Like I jumped off the stage. They're like, where'd he go? And I got on Instagram real quick and it was available. 
And then I went and looked for the domain. It was available. And I went and looked at Twitter and all these things. It was available. I was like, this is it. And I started up again in um, June of 2021 last year and uh, just built my brand uh, right on top of that. And uh, it's been Mr. Monetize Everything ever since. That makes sense. Because I was going to I was gonna ask you about that. Because when I first saw some of your older videos, when you click on it, it goes to nothing. Yeah. Like with your, with your um, I think, your tag. And it was really hard to track you down for a while. <laughs> um, but then eventually I got, got to the right site. I know I'm like past the time. Do you have a few more minutes? Cause, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, because obviously the, the reason why I also want to bring you on here is because again I'm in the financial literacy space, right? Uh-huh. Am I hitting? Am I bringing you on to try to trash anybody or anything like that? But um, there's a lot of courses that are being sold, and you know they monetize free information that they remix and they put out there. Which, contrary to what people think, I'm totally for it. M- my biggest question that I had for you was like, how do you add? a price tag to the value that you provide? Like what system do you use? Like when is it too low and when is it too much? And how do you compare your content to someone else's and then associate a price tag to it, if that makes sense? So pricing is one of the hardest things whenever it comes to developing courses. So I think for me, when I look at it is, you know, is this going to be a self-paced course or is it going to be a hybrid? Meaning that Is it going to be a part of my time, meaning that I'm going to show up for four weeks and teach and ask questions in addition to them getting access to the course? Or is it just going to be a training that they're just going to get uh, that they have to go through themselves, but it's very detailed workbooks, all that other kind of stuff. And then I think about, okay, if they follow everything that I teach, worst case scenario, how can they at least triple what they invest into this? And then I just kind of figure out what what my price point is going to be. Um, I don't have a lot of expensive courses. I don't believe in, you know, I know there's some out there that are like 10 grand and 15 grand and all that other stuff. And, you know, my, my thing on that, especially some of the stuff that I've even, because I'm a course creator, so I, I help people build courses. So I'm always taking different courses. And a lot of things that really frustrates me about it is the high pricing that people put on something for really, really generalized information. The way that I look at it is when someone's actually buying a course, if you're going to charge money for it, there needs to be a methodology there that's specific to yours that has your secret sauce. You know what I'm saying? If I'm just out there putting out, you know, I'm going to t- I'm going to create this course. It's going to be five thousand dollars. It's going to teach you how to save your first ten grand. And all it is is telling you put back a thousand dollars a month until you get to ten grand. Uh, but this is how I got this Bentley and this is how I got this. That's not that's not good to me. Um, and there's a lot of that that goes on. So for me, it's just making sure your methodology is in there, how much of your time is going to be there. And then, you know, figuring out, okay, how much do you charge an hour? You know, some people do it by the hour. So if you're a coach and you charge, I don't know, hundred and hundred, say hundred dollars an hour, and you know, you're going to show up and do a couple of lives and different things. You could kind of break it up into that. Um, You know, pricing is just, everybody has their own way of doing their pricing. I just kind of follow my own methodology and just try to keep it affordable to where someone um, can afford it. And I'm not going to charge, you know, like tens of thousands of dollars for a training, especially with me not even being there and just throwing them in some telegram group with thousands of other people. Yeah. And that's, I, I'm glad you touched on that. Cause again, like I, I think <clears> that you, when it came to um, set up courses, cause I think eventually I may sell a course, I don't know, introduction to investing or something, but my, my biggest concern. So I, I don't like to do things that everyone else is doing. If I can't provide, like you say, your secret sauce or whatever. I hate to use that word because it's like one of my red flag words, right? But I know what you mean, but you want to put your own spin on it, right? You want to you want to provide something that nobody else is providing. And um, but I've seen, I've been through so many courses and I've most of them have been pretty solid, right? Decent price point. But there has have been ones where it's just outrageously priced for what you get. But like you said, I also I believe that if you do a live, you should charge more than you do with like pre-recorded stuff. Do you agree with me on that? Sure. Yeah. Cause like, I mean, cause with the live, you get a little bit more of that one-on-one interaction, even though if you're like, let's say you have an audience of 20 people, you still have the, these people have ability to ask you questions, which you otherwise wouldn't get on like pre-recorded pre-made content. Right. And, and, and that's why I was just kind of curious to see what your thoughts were when it comes to how to attach a price tag to certain products. Um, for somebody, uh, 
who wants to get into the space like you're in, what recommendation, re recommendations do you have for them to get started? Start with the end in mind first. So if you're going to create a course on anything, start with what is the outcome this person is going to get? You know, if you're creating a credit course, they follow everything step by step that can get into the 700. So if you're creating a course on stock investing, if they follow everything I say, they're going to be able to perform their own technical analysis. Um, if your stock course is on the fundamental side, they're going to do everything to be able to read a 10Q statement. They're going to be able to break down the balance sheets, find what the dividends is, is the payout too high based on, you know what I'm saying? Like all those terms. Once you know like what the outcome is, then you need to start taking a step back. What steps do they need to take in the shortest way possible to get there? And how are they going to do it? And you should be able to come up with that. You shouldn't have to go and say, OK, let me go watch this video and see what they say about this or that, what they say about that. Like you should have your own methodology, right? Maybe your methodology might be similar to some people, but it's the way that you do it, because that's what people are paying for. How do you do it? Not like what did you find on YouTube or whatever and decide to put into a course? Like what do you do when you are researching stocks? What do you do when you're starting a business? What do you do when you're building, you know, your index fund portfolio or your rental portfolio or whatever you know what i'm saying like a lot of the people that i work with they've got to have a methodology uh or if i feel like they're more confused about what they teach and what they do i don't i just say i don't think we're going to be a good fit so just make sure you know start with the end in mind work backwards on what steps they need to take to get to that end result and start packaging that up and putting it in a way to where it's easy for them to understand Break down the terminologies. Don't expect people to understand uh, what, uh, you know, fundamental analysis means. Break down what that is. Break down the difference between those two. Break down what a broker is like. Simplify it as much as possible. That's what I've been known for in mind is if you really know your stuff, you should be able to simplify it to where someone put their child there and said, hey, I want you to watch this so you can learn this. They would be able to consume it and do it. Got you. Thank you for that. Um, once you gave up your nine to five, I, I got to ask, that had to be scary, right? Making that leap. It was because I probably should have made the leap, uh, maybe two years before I did, but I just wasn't mentally. I wasn't there. I was just like, Oh, you know, what if I don't make any more money? What if it doesn't work? And, you know, all those things that I had, you know, whenever I started the whole eBay course, you know, what if this, you know, what if it doesn't work? What if this doesn't work? It was scary. You know, insurance, insurance is going to be more expensive. And, you know, I, I, my son goes to this school, you know, I'm, I, all those things were in my head. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was like, if you don't do it now, you're probably not going to do it later. You need that time back. You've been doing really well with the part time that you have. Imagine what you have when you have a full, you know what I'm saying, broad sense of. Absolutely, man. And I, I definitely appreciate your time. Please tell people where they can. I mean, obviously, the link is below. But um, can you tell people what, like, what is it that you offer? Um, like what courses are you are you selling? What how would it work by signing up with you? Yeah. So uh, you can find me on Instagram or, uh, you know, um, Clubhouse or Twitter. Mr. Monetize everything. Obviously, as you can see at the top, Mr. George Pitts on Twitter. Uh, I've got a lot of, you know, uh, trainings for people at every level. So my main flagship course is called Course to Profits, where it teaches people how to uh, develop their course, how to develop and build their email list, um, how to record and outline it, um, taking them through that whole entire process of, you know, building out your course, growing out your page with digital marketing. Because if you have a course to sell and don't have an audience, it kind of defeats the purpose. So it has everything in there for you to learn how to build your audience, build your course, you know, run, you know, a webinar or, you know, have different selling methods for that. Um, and if you're someone out there that you're just like, uh, you know, I don't know what I should offer. I don't know who my audience is. I don't know what I offer. Uh, but we have our niche to profits course, which is just twenty seven dollars that teaches people step by step how to find your niche and how to identify your target audience to create an avatar. So, you know, who you speak to, what you bring to the marketplace, most importantly, who you serve and what you serve, you know, what you serve them. And so those are the things that I've got going right now. And, uh, you know, right now we're just we're just building and helping other coaches and content creators, you know, turn what they do and their one to ones or maybe a lot of content creators that have 
offline businesses, like a lot of my clients are real estate investors and they want to, they build brands and develop content on real estate. And we help them turn that into a course to where they can offer to their audience that constantly are asking them, you know, hey, do you teach this? Can you teach me? And so that's kind of what we do in, in, in the audience that we help. Appreciate you, George. Last question, promise. Last question. <laughs> no for, uh, for everyone out there, because you are in this space and there's so many people dropping courses left and right, some half-baked, some not, are there any red flags that you recommend people look out for when it comes to buying courses or subscribing to services or anything like that? My advice on that is follow their content first. Um, follow their content, you know, see if they're giving value. You know, one of the things that I look for is, are you telling me all the time to invest into myself and to change my mindset? And this is what I did to start my business. Are you really giving me anything that you're trying to teach me in this course? Right. Are you giving me any value? Here are three tips. Here are three systems. Here are three this. Or is it always, you no, know, you got to get into my course if you want to learn what broker I use to buy my stocks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Basic stuff like that. Um, to me, that's that's a red flag you want to watch out for. Uh, make sure that they're giving value and that they're they understand that. I think the second thing is reach out to them, you know, ask them questions, see how they are. Um, and I'd say the last thing uh, to watch out for is, you know, don't be enticed to invest into something. I tell people this all the time and I always say it could hurt myself, but I don't care. Don't invest into something you can't afford. You know, don't let someone peer pressure you into investing into a five or ten thousand dollar program that you don't have the money for. And you really can't afford to take on another payment to, you know, get into that. Like, make sure it's something that you can afford and that it's something that you want to do. Don't get into it because, oh, you're going to make a lot of money. Because trust me, we talked about it with web design and SEO. There's some stuff you can get into. And you're like, if you don't understand it and you get into it and you hate it, you're still on the hook for making that payment. You got all this, you know, invested into it and you might end up hating it and want to throw away. So make sure you understand what you're getting into. Make sure what, that you understand what's what's it going to take and, you know, the value. Because everyone's going to make it seem like it's easy. They're going to make it seem like it's easy. Make, it, there's nothing about entrepreneurship that's easy. It's 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 stress. It's, you know, you're building an audience. You've got to build it. You know, you got to build a brand. You've got to show up. You've got to put out content. There's a lot that goes into an online business that many people try to make simple. You know what I'm saying? It's not. Make sure it's something you want to do and that it's something you can afford. Everyone's always going to say it's the last time you're going to see this. But again, that won't be the last time you'll see it. Have an opportunity to learn that skill if you need to. Just make sure you're in a position. To Thank you so much, George. Everybody, make sure you follow this brother on Twitter at Mr. George Pitts and on Instagram, Mr. Monetize Everything. You guys know I don't bring people on here that I don't bet. So I, ooh, I like his brother. Like I said, I've been watching his content for a while. I like him. He goes live quite often on Instagram, by the way. Um, so definitely check him out. Follow him. Check out his program. If you're trying to get into the, the space of monetizing stuff, check this guy out. Once again, George, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Mark with Trading with the Dummy, and we just finished interviewing Mr. Monetize Everything. See you guys in the next video. Peace out. Thanks, George, man. I really appreciate it. Thank man, you so much. I'm sorry I, I held you.